Oh, Canada, we stay at home for thee. Hey, everybody, welcome to Stay at Home Cinema. I'm Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director at TIFF and the co-head, and I want to welcome you all. We're doing it again. We're going all across Canada with Crave and around the world on Instagram Live. Tonight, we're watching the movie Captain Fantastic, uh, starring... Vigo Mortensen, and he'll be joining us in a minute. Be but I want to begin by uh, just giving some shout outs. First, to all Indigenous storytellers across this land, to all of the people who help keep TIFF going, uh, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell. Uh, Bell is um, the people who are responsible for Crave, so they've been great partners on this. Also, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa. All of the donors, all of the public supporters, uh, on, at all levels of government, members of TIFF as well. All of you are helping us uh, keep going during this wild time as well. So thank you all for that. Um, and a shout out to my wife, Carolyn Hugh. This is her office. Welcome to it. I'm going to be doing this from here for a while. Uh, you will know the star of Captain Fantastic from movies like A History of Violence and Eastern Promises, both directed by David Cronenberg, Canada's own from Green Book, where he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor, Portrait of a Lady, and of course, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. For his work uh, in Captain Fantastic, he was nominated for a Golden Globe, an Independent Spirit Award, and uh, an Oscar for Best Actor. The film was uh, premiered in 2016 at the Sundance Film Festival, went on to play at the Cannes Film Festival as well, uh, did really well around the world, won tons of awards, and we are gonna try to find Vigo right now. Let's see if we can call him up on the Crave Canada. Uh, I am looking for Crave Canada. I'm gonna have to search it up. Because Vigo is not an Instagram dude, so this is how we're gonna do it. All right, this looks like this is going to take a moment. And I will get to it as soon as we can. In the meantime, I want to let you know that we also have some uh, members questions. And we're going to try to get to those as well. And, uh, and let's see if we can find Figo. Where are you? Welcome to the internet. <laughs> waiting, waiting. All right, I think we're making progress. And I had to Mr. Vigo Mortensen, how you doing? I'm coming to you now. All right, all right, good. I've been, good. I've been watching you. Just how are you? Know, I'm going to a quiet room. The others are watching a movie right now, different uh -huh. movie. Now. And um, I've been watching you for the past 20 minutes. Been, <laughs> Make a fool of myself, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, whatever, I don't know. This is How are you? No, I'm good. Good. And you're staying at home, are you? Yes, I am. What? I knew it. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, yeah. I still can't fathom, right. Vigo Mortensen remains a fan of the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. We're in Toronto. Did you know that? I know you are. That's why I did it. <laughs> Um, here's, uh, here's one of our treasures. Here's the Shepherd Ferry poster. Oh, poster. yeah. Clever, That's fantastic. Huh? He made that specially for the movie. Yeah, he did. That's beautiful. He was nice enough to give me one. He gave Matt Ross one. And... Mm -hmm. Anyway, how are you doing? Nice. I'm so stressful of this. We're good. We're good. You know, we're just uh, <laughs> we're just trying to trying to keep going and try to you know share something with people across Canada as well. So I'm glad that you're able to do this. Thank you. Um, yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about how you came to this film and the role of Ben in Captain Fantastic. It's about a family that's chosen to live in isolation of a sort in the woods. And I know you live a little, little bit off the grid for your typical you know, um, actor as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what was interesting to you about the character and the story? Well, I used to actually live in Northern Idaho. And, you know, throughout my life at different times, I've lived uh, either in the woods or out in the countryside, and I, I do like that. But no, what drew me to the script was uh, Matt Ross's script, you know, the 
writer director of Captain Fantastic. It was a great story, very well structured, and you know a big challenge. As I said to Matt, and he obviously knew better than I did. I said, if you don't find some great kids, you know, six amazing young people, it's going to be hard to make a. Uh, I won't be as good as your script, you know. But he, you know, Jeannie McCarthy was a casting director. Casting directors don't always get acknowledged, but she's a great casting director, and she helped us find these kids. And you know, we did uh, did auditions with all the final candidates. And anyway, it was the script, really. You know, I, mean, I just thought it was a, had a lot of potential. The story, mm -hmm. and I also like Matt Ross as very intelligent actor, director, writer, and uh, his ideas about how he wanted to execute it. You know, he had a very limited mm -hmm. time frame in which to shoot this, and we changed locations almost every day. And as, as you can see in the movie, it's outdoors a lot of it, very tricky, especially in the Pacific Northwest. You know, rain and all kinds of things happen, but. Uh, and you have kids with limited working hours and so forth, but but it worked. He, you know, what I saw him do as a director was what I've seen directors like um, you know uh, Dave Cronenberg and others do is that they prepare mm. thoroughly. I mean, you can't over prepare, you know, for a shoot because once the shoot starts, it's like a, a train leaving the station or a boat leaving the harbor. There's not much you can do about it. If storms are ahead or you have to be ready to deal with it. You have to be in sync as a team. You have to have prepared for as many unforeseen obstacles as you can. Mm -hmm. And that's what Matt did, you know. He really prepared thoroughly beforehand, which I like to do as an actor. So it was nice to see a director doing that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's really why it, it, he you know, pulled it off. Mm -hmm. How did you prepare for the role? I, I understand you, there were some, some physical objects that, that you brought along with you. Um, yeah, well, we had a uh, part of the preparation for not just for me, but for everybody was individually people had to do things, had to be get in shape, and you know, the kids all had to promise to not use things like what I'm holding in my hand right now. <laughs> I, yes, they were banned from the set, there was no candy on the set, there was no, you know, it wasn't like some doer, or like overly strict situation, but everybody was into it. It's like, this is the way it's going to be. And then they learned how to make fires. And in some cases, the kids learned how to taxidermy, really? um, how, to, how to butcher deer, how to do all kinds of things, how to be out in the outdoors. They even had some kind of uh, camping situations where they're left on their own, and pretty much in the middle of the night. And, uh, and they did all kinds of training, rock climbing, I don't know, you name it. We learned all kinds of things together, martial arts, and it was a lot of fun. And did a lot of reading. There was a, Matt Ross sent a, a list, a, a reading list, all kinds of you know, philosophy, social political books, novels, um, uh, science, I mean, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. you know, tracking in the woods. I mean, you know, it was like this big, boot camp before we started, which helped us bond too, you know, because mm -hmm. it, there was a can-do feeling about it, and Matt Ross had a you know, good sense of humor about it. He was expected a lot from us, but he knew how to create a, a set where there was a friendly atmosphere, where it was fun. Mm -hmm. um, that idea of retreating from the world, which the family in the film does, a lot of us have had that forced upon us now. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on just what what that does to you as a person or as a family, if you 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 have to uh, depend just on yourselves. Well, it's true. I think I think it's possible that once um, once the coronavirus uh, settles down a little bit and and we eventually get a a real cure, a real vaccine for the virus and people sort of decide what they're going to do next. I think some people, maybe a lot of people, will decide they want to live in a slightly less hurried way, in a more self-sufficient way. Maybe some people will even want to leave cities, you know, like the family does in Captain Fantastic. You don't have to do that. I mean, you can, you can live in a simpler way and in a way more conscious of your surroundings and, um, and of nature. 
more connected if you want to, even living in a city like Toronto or any other city in the world. And, um, you know, I just think being more mindful is, is something that I think maybe a lot of people are coming to those conclusions on their own, you know, when you're shut in for week after week and you have to be a little more resourceful, you have a plumbing problem, you might not be able to get someone to come fix it. You might have to learn how to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've always thought in life, you know, when people say, oh, I'm bored, um, you know, I mean, I sound a little probably like the character in Kevin Fantastic, but I've, my whole life I've always thought there's no excuse to be bored. Afraid, nervous, afraid to die, afraid that something's going to happen. And there's a lot of people are thinking that they're going to get sick, that some, someone they love is going to be, that it's going to touch them. And I think that almost every single one of us that are now, you know, community kidding at this moment on this phone or through our phones, we're all going to be touched directly, somebody very close to us by this virus, it's a reality. So to be afraid, to be worried, to be frustrated, to be angry, sure, but to be bored, I mean, life is too short. Mm. And I think at a time like this, people realize how short life really can be and how yeah. short it always was. So you learn to make <clears throat> something of each day. You learn that there are simpler pleasures. You don't have to have every gadget. You don't have to constantly have your mind uh, reeling with all kinds of um, things to keep yourself busy, to keep yourself from getting bored. There are simple ways, you know, just, and just, I think a lot of people have found that they're communicating with other people. Maybe people that they neglected to communicate with for a long time, or people they knew a long, long time ago. Um, I mean, it's wonderful, this thing that we're looking at each other through. Um, the, the advances, the wild advances in, in global mass communication are wonderful, but so far, I don't think we've taken that much advantage of it. You know, a lot of people use the, these things, this, this ability to communicate instantly and, and so thoroughly to, to um, reinforce their pre-existing you know, prejudices and yeah. likes and dislikes, rather than to reach out, and I think this is what the movie Captain Fantastic does. I saw that in the script, and I feel that when I, I felt that when I watched the movie. The idea that you can make a conscious effort to find some kind of two-way conversation, communication with people that you don't necessarily agree with. Maybe with people that you don't like at all. Mm -hmm. And you may not end up becoming friends, but at least you can. You can learn something. Yeah, here you can learn something from everybody and everything. And I think people are learning a lot during this, this kind of scary period mm -hmm. um, for some people, very scary. And, you know, to say you're bored, look, if you're sitting there with, with this in your hand, if you have a roof over your head, if you have some food, you have some company, whether you do or not have company, the fact that you have a roof over your head and some food, and that you can actually practice social distancing, you're very fortunate. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who yeah, can't even who don't get to do, that. do it. I'm not talking just about refugee camps, I'm talking about that, homeless people, people in very crowded um, cities in the world where they don't have the health care that they have in Canada or the United States or other you know, parts of the of Western society um, or the, say, first, first tier of nations in terms of civilization and technological advances. You know, we're, you're fortunate. So, yeah, I mean, very true. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's kind of the, the spirit of the, of the Cash family and Captain Fantastic. I don't think you'd ever hear any of them say that they were bored. If they're bored, then they'll find something. Yeah, to make they, them... can, they can actually make their own entertainment. They can, they can find things to, to be curious about and they stay curious. Um, and, I think, and I think as much as they are isolated, what I thought was interesting about the story was that they're not isolated in this um, in a sort of paranoid willfully ignorant way. They're not extremist um, 
deniers of, of scientific truths, you know, because you do have, you do have uh, in cases, pockets of people, you know, um, in different parts of the world, different parts of North America, certainly, that are averse to science, that don't want to know anything about it. Sometimes these pockets of, you know, small populations are, it's religious-based, but it's, whether it's religious or not, it's an ideological approach that that says you know I don't want to know you know I mean um, uh, and that's that seems sad to me yeah yeah that's really a remarkable family in the film and and I think a good model for a lot of us who might not stop to think through the way uh, this family does in terms of just how to live your life and how to make the most of every mm -hmm. single moment. I think we need that uh, now, you know, more than ever. Um, we're, um, we're just in the next uh, couple of minutes that we have left. I want to just go to one of our TIFF members, Susan Muir, who was asking about your career as a whole, directors you've worked with, and this is probably hard to do, but which director in your career have you been most in tune with creatively and why? Um, and by the way, I don't know what your time limit is, but I'm game to go as long as you want. Okay, cool. Um, I, I've been, really, I've been, I mean, I know there may be more people that get a chance, then we'll get a chance to answer. I'd like to answer as many as possible. I've been fortunate as an actor. I mean, part, part of it has to do with the fact that I'm picky in terms of, I like to do movies, I try to, say yes to movies, if I have the choice, um, that I'd like to see, that I'm going to learn something from. And yes to directors that are going to, that I feel, I know they're going to teach me something. And I've been fortunate. You know, obviously, David Cronenberg, I've worked with three times and would love to work with again. And it's beyond having worked with him as director. We're also friends and we have a good connection. And. Um, I just like the way he prepares. I like the way he treats his crew and his cast. And he's just very intelligent. He's unusually intelligent. Maybe the most intelligent director I've ever worked with. And just as an intelligent person, a curious person about life and people and what makes him tick. Matt Ross, I couldn't imagine anyone doing a better job than what he did with, with making this movie Captain Fantastic. But, especially the way he, the atmosphere he created on set, the way he, he worked with people. Um, uh, there's a director named David Olhoffen, French director. He made a movie that was actually was shown at TIFF called uh, Far From Men. It was a French movie set in the 1950s in Algeria, in French and Arabic. And he also had a very good way of preparing and working with crews. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't pick one. I mean, David Cronenberg, maybe, because I've worked with him more than anyone else, and I've gotten to know him probably better than anyone else that I've worked with. Because do you think we'll see it. another film from David Cronenberg anytime? I think so. He's working. He's yeah. trying to get one right now, and it's you know I don't. I'll let him talk about that when he's ready. But uh, he's trying to get it together, and. Um, and I would, I would participate in that. I already said I would. And uh, I, I don't understand. I never understood. I've said this before. You know, each time he's tried to make a movie, no matter how good his track record, his track record has always been. You know, that he comes in on budget or under budget, on time or before time. He doesn't waste people's money. He always makes a good product, a really good movie, thought provoking movie. And then he has all this trouble raising money to make the next That's one. That's you know? crazy. It's exhausting. People just need you know, to give Dave and Cronenberg his money. You know, this is, he's been doing this for decades now. Come on. Any of you that are listening. <laughs> <laughs> if you money, have money, money to give to David Cronenberg to get this next film made, let's just do it. Okay. I mean, you know, you see what um, he's making every year. Why, why doesn't Cronenberg get to make a movie every year if he feels like it? You know, I think, I don't know if he'd want to do that now, but in the past, I'm sure he work more regularly. Absolutely. Part of it is that he challenges viewers and critics uh, because he's mm -hmm. always trying something new, you know. It's hard to say, well, that's a David Cronenberg movie, I can tell. 
There's, I guess there's certain things about it. I mean, yes, he's a, you know, usually the same cinematographer, and, you know, production designer, and, you know, people that work with him score, and usually it's Howard Shore, and recent years and all that. But, but there's something different about each movie. He tackles mm -hmm. different kinds of stories, different, uh, and he shoots the movies in slightly different ways. So maybe it's because People don't know what to expect what from them. Expect, exactly. And in the market, they want to say, okay, I know what you're going to do. That's reliable. That's how it's going to look. And right. Credit is going to look like this. It'll have this beginning, middle, and end, and so forth. And I can take that to the bank. Mm -hmm. And David will say, well, yeah, but I want to make this story. And we go, why do you want to do that? Because that's what I want to do. Instead of stopping and thinking, does he ever let you down? Rarely. <laughs> yes. Rarely. Yes. <laughs> no, that but, is a good question. Um, I want to go to another couple of questions, if, if you don't mind, from um, uh, one from a member. Uh, this is going back to um, to Captain Fantastic. Uh, it's from uh, Ben White, who asks, did you come up with your own ideas of the character of Ben Cash for the film, or did Matt Ross have a very clear idea of what he wanted for the character? Matt was very generous. I, I, I think we were on a... On a pretty much the same wavelength, but but I later, I remember an interview he gave where he said that his initial idea of the character might have been slightly, uh, I don't know what the word is, ironic or just more uh, like a teasing kind of presence with his kids and sort of, and maybe I went in a more like serious direction in some aspects, but I thought it was funny it, the earnestness of the character was, to me, what was at times funny and touching. Yeah, that he was there's a sincerity about. to him right. that's really that's moving. Right. He believes what he's doing yeah. to his family. Yeah, maybe that layer was a little different. I don't know, but I think we were pretty much mm -hmm. in sync, you know. Um, I don't know. He, uh, yeah. There's, there's something that comes to mind that was said, by the way, when we were speaking about all the world, the state of the world, and of course I'm speaking in this movie, but there's something that always bears remembering, and, and it's one of the kids in the movie that says it, and I, I don't remember it exactly, uh, so I'll paraphrase, but it's something, Noam Chomsky is one of their heroes, if you yeah. haven't seen the movie, celebrate Noam Chomsky's birthday in December. They celebrate his birthday, yeah. Instead of Christmas and all that. <laughs> And he, um, I mean, it's, it's not Christmas is anywhere near his birthday, but that's when they, they decide that that's what they're going to do instead of Christmas. They have a cake, and they, that's what they do every year, celebrate Noam's birthday. Uncle, no, Uncle Noam, as they call him, Noam Chomsky. And one of the kids, you know, and they read him, even the 60s and seven-year-olds, and one of the little kids, one of the sort of the middle kids says, uh, I think it's Relian, that says, uh, quotes Chomsky, and he says, if you assume that there is no hope, then you guarantee that there will be no hope. Mm. Um, if, you, if you assume that, there, that, that there's an instinct for freedom, that there are opportunities to change things, then you can be part of making a better world. I mean, it's that simple. You can sit there and go, nah, I'm, I'm not interested, or things aren't turning out the way that I thought they would when I was younger, or now with the coronavirus, all bets are off. You can be negative if you want. It's a state of mind. Or you can say, okay, every situation, no matter how bad it might be, is an opportunity for change. You know, I mean, I just look out the window every day and I've, I've never seen a spring in a city where the air was so clean day after day, night after night, where you're seeing stars, we're actually hearing birds because there's no traffic, there's no pollution really, there's no oral pollution, there's no air pollution. And I like it. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that part of it is good. A year from now, we'll go back to having smog and things, but maybe maybe a little less, maybe people will be a little more conscious about, do I always need to jump in the car and drive down the street, you know, can I walk? 
Yeah. Do I actually need to go buy stuff? You know, now you, you don't go out as much, so you think, oh, what do I need? I'll get what I need, and then, well, we'll just, What are know. the essentials? Yeah, and you'll have your leftovers, and you have, you know, again, I talk about leftovers, and I'm conscious of people who don't have anything. Hmm. So, again, it's, you know, you can't really complain if you're, you have a place to sleep, and you have some food, and all that. But anyway, I just, whatever. I, I'll try to be. <laughs> no, I was good. Um, listen, we, we usually we, we go until 7.20 uh, with this conversation, then we start the movie at 7.30. But I started late due to my own technical nonsense. And um, and we got you with us. So if you don't mind, we'll go for another couple minutes and then we'll start the film at 7.40 um, with everyone. We try to watch it in sync uh, so we can respond to it in real time. Uh, this is from Eric on Facebook, um, and he said that I heard you were cast as Aragorn days before filming Lord of the Rings. Is it easier just to jump into a character and discover it as you go, or to have months of prep for a character? Well, one of the most important things you can learn, any of you who are thinking of getting, getting into acting, if you're you know very young and thinking about trying it, or if you're older and you decide you want to try it, is to be flexible. So, you know, you, have, you work with all kinds of different actors, directors, cameramen, scripts. You have to be able to adapt to the situation. Um, that's just the way it happened. And I had not read the Lord of the Rings book. And I started reading it on the plains in New Zealand, basically. And I read and read and read as much as I could and you know, read it as fast as I could and tried to find connections that I in, that, in the case of Lord of the Rings, I, I recognize certain elements in Tolkien's work that was connected to stories I knew from my childhood, you know, the Nordic sagas and, you know, some Celtic stuff as well. But Which but Tolkien was, knew well. He, he knew the Nordic sagas quite well, as I understand it. He did, yeah. And um, so there were certain archetypes that I recognized, Aragorn I recognized in some of the sagas, Volsung saga, whatever, but... You know, sometimes when you're thrown into something and somebody just has faith in you, you can do it. Sometimes there's something good about that shock. I don't think it's good to make it a habit because then you start finding a certain kind of crutch that you, well, that's how I deal with shock. I, I prefer preparation. I love rehearsing, but most directors, film directors, A, don't have the time and the budget to rehearse people. And a lot of them don't like it, you know. Cronenberg doesn't care, that he never rehearses. But you can talk to him about anything. You can ask him whatever you want before the movie starts shooting and, and while it's shooting. Um, again, I think it's communication, but uh, in the case of Lord of the Rings, I didn't really have much choice. I had to just get with it. I was fortunate in that the first things I had to shoot were pretty, mostly non-verbal, you know, sword fighting you know, scenes. So. It was just physical work, so I got comfortable with the character's clothes and weapons and how he walked before I had to start speaking. Mm -hmm. And the character is written by, you know, uh, Peter Jackson, Fran Walsh, and Philip Owens. In that, in their adaptation, <clears throat> Aragorn is less voluble than he is in Tolkien's books. So mm -hmm. I had a break for a little while until I had to start speaking. <laughs> that's good it's really one of those iconic roles and you've done so many of them um in your career and i know you've directed a film called falling which premiered at the sundance film festival a beautiful film uh and i hope people will get uh, more chances to see that soon um the last thing i want to ask you though is not about movies at all it's got to be about i'm sorry i just missed that yeah go ahead a lot of the stuff i and talking about that I learned from people like David Cronenberg and Matt Ross, um, directors like that, the way they prepared their shoes, that helped me a lot with Falling, which was also the movie I shot, which was a very, uh, that was a relatively fast shoot, kids involved and prepared very thoroughly, thanks to what I learned from them. But anyway, just an aside. That's great. Um, how did you become a fan of the Montreal Canadiens? That's my last question. Um, well, I was born in New York City, but then as an infant, my dad got work in, um, my dad's from Denmark, my mother's from the United States. Her dad was from Nova Scotia. 
Um, so I have a little bit of Canada in our family. And um, uh, they, uh, my dad got to work in South America. So I was raised until I was most of the first decade of my life in Argentina where you know, football, soccer, football is the number one sport like hockey is in Canada. And um, when I left there, it was 1970, and there was no internet, there was no cable TV, there was, no, you know, there was a couple channels. I moved up to the Canadian border on the St. Lawrence River in northern New York State. And there was, you know, I don't know, an N, local NBC, CBS affiliate, and then there was uh, CBA, CBC, and, um, and there was radio, and there was, you know, hockey. And I had lost touch with all, you know, with the Spanish or the Argentine background, and, uh, and my soccer team, each other colored red and blue, San Lorenzo, and suddenly I'm watching the TV, and I'm watching uh, the Montreal Canadiens play this game. I don't know what the hell they were playing. But <laughs> kind of like football, but it was faster and with sticks. And I was trying to figure out how, and then, and then I, so then I was like, I would listen to it on the radio when I, when it wasn't on TV. And so I was listening to it in, in French and I wanted to learn that. So I started to learn a little bit about that, but I was fascinated by the fans, the Habs fans, you know, it helps when your team is great at that time mm -hmm. in the seventies, they were, Unbeatable, and uh, a lot of great players, legends, and um, and they had red and blue in their colors. They had red, white, and blue, and <laughs> and so I just I liked the passion of the fans. It reminded me of the Argentine soccer fans. Uh -huh, okay, yeah. And I don't know. I just learned about the game. I got to be obsessive about it, and they became my team. They replaced until years later when I could find out what was going on in Argentina. It'd be different now. Kid leaves Argentina and when they're 11 years old. They can right. use an iPhone, they can follow the games, they can probably watch the games on their iPhone from them. But I lost complete touch. So the, the Montreal Canadiens replaced that, at the time, very important part of my childhood. And I probably, probably kept me kind of like a child ever since. <laughs> Well, I love that you've remained a fan, though, Vigo. This is amazing. You showed up at the Toronto Film Festival wearing a full-on Habs jersey on stage, which I absolutely love. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and very brave of you in a Leafs town as well. Vigo, thank you so much for doing this. We're going to watch Captain Fantastic. I'm going to say let's start it at 7.45 Eastern. Um, uh, uh, we're watching across Canada on Crave. Uh, if you can join us, we're going to live tweet it as well. Uh, anyone who wants to join us for that. Just we want to get your reactions to the film. Vigo's fantastic in it. Vigo, thank you. You got one more thing. Go ahead. I'll just throw, I'll just throw a quote out there to take it with you for whatever it might mean. And that's maybe watching Captain Fantastic, where you see different family models and different points of view, and people in the end, I won't give it away, but finding a way to communicate to a degree. Uh, and it's a quote from uh, my father, my late father, who's from Denmark, uh, Søren Kierkegaard, philosopher, philosopher, he said, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. So that goes for the coronavirus, Captain Fantastic, then your daily life, and I hope you enjoyed the movie as much as uh, we enjoyed making it. And I thank you, Cameron, for facilitating this. I'm sorry we got off to a rough start. Hey, it's my, ple my pleasure. Thank you for doing this. And yeah, I think this was a fantastic opportunity to just get your thoughts on the film, and I look forward to watching it again. Thank you. Hope to see you soon, Vigo. Stay yep. safe. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs>